Uh, I was writing for a long time before I um, thought about getting published and that was very deliberate because um, I, I felt for quite a long time that um, what I was writing, I just, it wasn't ready for, um, for anyone else, in, really. Um, and there were kind of formal issues that I, I had that were difficult to, um, I was having difficulty resolving. So I was writing quite short pieces, um, quite fragmented pieces. I wasn't really writing in a very conventional kind of way. Uh, in terms of it being very plot driven or character driven. Um, so in some senses, like the work I was producing was seemed quite um, kind of obscure or abstract. And I, I just thought, well, I'm not sure how I'm gonna um, have a reader engage with, with this, you know? It's gonna be, it's gonna be too challenging and um, and I didn't, I didn't really, the idea of doing a course or something like that didn't really appeal to me very much because I knew that the problems that I, I had and I knew the way that I wrote was a reflection on how I felt about um, just being a human being and it was related to ideas to do with, you know, self and where ideas of self come from and um, like a kind of a, a distrust, say, of, um, the normal apparatus of a novel like character and so on because I I just I just didn't feel like those vehicles were um, I guess like philosophically I, I had problems with them I suppose um, so I I knew that I um, it wasn't a case of, of solving this problem by learning how to do those things. Mm. I, I had to kind of still have um, a kind of a, a conviction in what I was doing, but somehow make it just better and in, engaging for um, a, a reader. So that, and that just, took, that just took quite a bit of time, really, and a lot of, you know, reading and a lot of thinking. And, and then I was involved um, for quite a long time in theatre um, and working in uh, performance. And actually that experience was quite useful in a way, in thinking about how self is represented. Um, so through various different routes really, I, um, and yeah, like I, and I remember reading quite a lot to do with phenomenology and uh, the importance of say, direct everyday experience, um, what that can reveal about um, um, a person and, um, so it was, yeah, it was a slow process, but I, I didn't, I didn't really mind that. And then uh, there came a point where I thought, okay, I have to, uh, I have to see now, you know, if, if this is, if this is, um, something people want to read, you know? Mm. Um, so at that point I, I started, but I was quite, I was quite, um, kind of strategic in a way. I was sort of quite pr pragmatic about how I, how, how I approached that. Like, um, I remember going to a literature festival and attending a panel discussion. There were some publishers there and they were just talking about, or oh, there was an agent and a publisher and a magazine editor and they were talking about, you know, how it, how it happens, you know. Because I, I really didn't want to think it was just like some sort of magic thing that you suddenly just get discovered, you know. I was like, okay, there must be some steps I can take here, you know. And um, yeah, sending stories to magazines or, um, competition so I yeah I guess I just started doing that really. With Pond um, my, my first book some of the um, editors that, that read it initially um, wanted had suggestions for me to uh, develop it in I guess more conventional ways. Um, there was an editor who suggested I um, uh, have I don't know like things happen in it and more people and I said well you know it's not really it's about nothing really happening and about being on your own so that doesn't how's that going to work you know <laughs> it's like a different book that you're describing and um, different from the one I've I've created so I, I just don't see how that's possible 
Um, and something else that I found interesting, another comment that he made was um, the, the register was kind of shifting around. And he didn't, he didn't uh, pick up on that in a complimentary way. He, he saw it as a problem, this inconsistency, and, uh, and, and wanted something kind of more s smooth, I suppose, uh, in terms of tone and so on. Um, and I really, I really didn't want to do that. Um, because, and voice is something that really, really interests me. I think about it an awful lot. And I was reading back over some notes recently um, uh, from my reading of a book by Bactan, um, Heteroglossia, and his thoughts on that and the idea of um, just having a lot of different voices and contradictory voices and influence and, and what we're in dialogue with and being in dialogue all the time, even with, say, like, um, you know, non-human things, objects, nature, things around us, you know. I was kind of having a bit of a weird kind of conversation with this uh, big, I guess, nut and bolt in my shower earlier today. There were two of them. And I was like, what are they? You know, I'm looking at them and I'm like, they look so um, quite austere or something. And quite, I don't know. I was like, what are they doing there anyway? Is it, am I supposed to hang something on that? Or and then you have this crazy, you're in the shower, and you're having this strange dialogue almost with these things, you know? It's so funny. So there's this constant sense of, yeah, being in, being in dialogue with, with, with things, your world all around you all the time. And Bhaktan writes about that really, really well. And then, of course, influences that we, that we have. Um, uh, and Checkout 19 um, looks, explores a lot of those, whether they're, I mean, I know in write-ups of Checkout 19, the emphasis has been a lot on the books that are mentioned in the intertextuality. But there's also a lot of reference to spoken language and uh, family sayings, you know. Um, so there are many things present in a person's voice um, and in the language that they use. And something back town says is I find really interesting. Is basically um, like a word has um, has its own history and it has its own story and it has, it comes charged with its own social context. And the words I use, of course, they've been around much, much longer than me. They're much older than me. I'm coming along and I'm using them. But they have their own history and their own connotations and their own associations. They're not just sitting there in a kind of a, a box and completely neutral, wait, waiting for me to arrange them into sentences to generate the meaning that I, I want. They're, there's so much already going on with them. There's already so much information that they contain. Um, and that's part of the frustration of using language, but it's also one of the very exciting things about, about using it, is kind of realizing that their, their, their um, heritage in a way, and, their, and even in discourse now, in day-to-day in -day, uh, use, they're always sort of evolving and changing and dropping in and out of favor or fashion. Or, um, so that's the kind of thing I think about more more than voice, because when people talk about voice, I think there's a, an association that with, you know, finding your voice and so on, these kinds of terms, that it's, it's linked with some sort of authenticity and some sort of unity. And I don't feel I necessarily have that. I, through even just a day, I'm changing not only moods and emotions and hormones and all of that, but yeah, you, you're in different social environments and um, it's just making those shifts, you know, throughout, throughout the day and they're subtle and it's not like you're being kind of fake, but you're certainly not just being this one thing throughout, you know. With Pond, the, the focus was very much on upon immediate experience and I think I think that was partly because I was coming out of um, a period where I had been studying for quite a long time, um, so a very sort of academic uh, phase, um, which was sort of heavy theoretically. I was looking at structuralism, and, and it, it got quite abstract in a sense. So even though I was looking at um, the, you know the key the key aspects of of being and life and experience at the same time 
the way that it was kind of being written about and uh, discussed and interrogated was in this very uh, r like removed very difficult um, way and uh, towards towards the end of that I started to, to read more about phenomenology which um, I guess reconnected me with um, the immediate and the present moment and the importance of being able to describe things in your own words which was a kind of a quite a strong uh, aspect uh, to phenomenology and, and connects it then. It was kind of a forerunner in a way to existentialism in that regard, you know, very much so. Um, and I, I really loved, I really loved all of that. I was like, oh yeah, and it kind of brought me back into the world. It took me out of this very cerebral kind of place, put me back into the world, into my body, into valuing what was going on day to day, moment to moment and valuing that and seeing, yeah, the value and the interest in that. Um, and so that, though that was the conditions, if you like, then that, that Pond came out of. Um, and, then, and then time passed, uh, the book came out, and I guess I made a shift in my own life and got to a certain point in my own life where I started to maybe look at the past. So the kind of the here and now wasn't quite as um, important to me or as, as uh, you know, charged or um, it just wasn't where my attention was. I was thinking about the past and I was thinking about why I was in Ireland. Um, and, um, and my life at that point, yeah, it didn't, it didn't feel all of a piece anymore. I definitely felt a sense of there being a past which I hadn't really experienced before in a way. I'd always felt like it, I was still in the same life or something, you know, it's kind of a strange feeling. Um, so I, yeah, I got interested in um, just some episodes from um, many years ago and um, that I'd written about and I've got a lot of writing from a long time ago and it's, it's interesting to read those pieces um, because for a long time I didn't really enjoy reading them very much because was to start with, sometimes I used to think that they were just rubbish and um, other times just because it takes you back to a place that isn't always that easy to go back to, you know. But um, yeah, then the time came and it was fine and I was able to kind of go there and, and get into some things and um, and I think as well it, during, you know, that period I, I read a lot of work by some women who write really, really well about experiences from their earlier life, like Annie Arnaud um, and Tove Ditlipson. And, I, you know, that kind of gave me a, some courage, I guess. Um, and it's tricky, it's tricky. Time is kind of funny because it's not like, obviously, you're, you're, you know, you're different, but at the same time, it's not about wanting to close any kind of gap or it's not about trying to say something now about something then from a position of knowing better. It's not about making any kind of a judgment on it or um, introducing a, a different, I guess, emotional texture that wasn't there then or it's, but it's or trying to make sense of things even, you know, I'm not, it's not trying to do that either. It's really, it's really hard to kind of know um, what to do with these different sort of temporal dimensions, I suppose. And Annie Elno writes about that difficulty so, so well, you know. She's like, what is it I'm trying to do here in a way, you know. And this is 50 years ago because she's like kind of 80 now. And am I trying to, what, what, what is the relation, I guess, between me and, and the girl then kind of thing? I am interested in, yeah, ideas, um, probably more than, say, story so I would be drawn to uh, writers who are um, I guess you know philosophical writers um, without being necessarily you know philosophers um, who, whose work is kind of you know rich in just exploring um, yeah ideas of, of, of selfhood and um, the passage of time and the effect that that has on our sense of self and um, 
And I, yeah, I do read a lot actually when I'm writing as well. I know some writers don't like to, um, but I, I really do. And, um, and I think that's, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons why Checkout 19 mentions so many books, because it felt, it felt kind of weird in a way to be writing this book and um, sort of, you know, almost like pretending that it's the only book or something, you know, and that it exists completely sort of independently on, on its own. It's like, well, no, not really. <laughs> like, the whole time, you know, I've been in conversation with so many other writers and books. Um, so I, I really wanted to, that to be just very, very apparent, you know, um, just very obvious and accessible for anyone reading it to know, you know, exactly um, what texts they were and what writers they were. Um, yeah, for sure. And I, I always feel like I'm in conversation, really. And for me, um, for me, being a writer is is um, like I feel like literature is this sort of I don't know, very big pool or something with all this sort of stuff and currents growing through it and just different um, I don't know, yeah, voices and depths and and that I'm sort of participating in this as well, you know, my kind of little kind of bit somewhere, I don't know, <laughs> I feel like this funny little, you know, eddy somewhere by the, by the rocks or something, just kind of going <laughs> round and round probably. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, how I, that's how I feel about it, that's how I can kind of conceive of it in my mind when I think about it. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I wouldn't want to like, I find it really hard to write incomplete with cutting myself away from that. I don't, I don't feel the need to do that, to find my own... Again, it's that thing, isn't it, of finding my, well, my own thoughts or my own voice. I don't even know what that would be. I don't know, you know? It's a relief, of course, to have published a second book. It's always a bit daunting, thinking about, about what comes next. And, and people are, are interested and they're asking you and, you know, the years kind of pass by. I think it was, yeah, the poem came out in 2015 and so seven, you know, seven years in the, in the publishing world now is quite a long time. Some, some writers are, you know, book a year or every couple of years at least. Um, so there was a, there was a, a kind of a, a significant gap between the books. Um, and there were, I guess, a number of reasons. Um, and why that occurred. As I said, I, I did write for a long time, um, sort of, you know, privately, without being published. Um, so to then be, you know, sort of professionalised and identified as a writer was quite a dramatic shift for me um, in, in many ways. And um, <laughs> I suppose affected some sort of existential crisis or something, I don't know. And then if, I don't know, and then it felt in a way like, the landscape changed quite a lot actually after Pond came out um, very, very quickly. Um, yeah, that was 2015 and then following on from that there was kind of quite an upsurge of female writing that looked very much at like um, personal experience and the body and um, they were quite strongly political. Um, uh, and I guess Me Too happened uh, and Time's Up and so there was this whole movement, this whole kind of feminist movement and I just wasn't really sure where to sit my, situate myself in all of that. Um, the writing was very sort of direct and very uh, strong and uh, courageous um, but I knew, I knew I wanted to write about those kinds of things myself, but I knew at the same time that that wasn't maybe the way I wanted to do it necessarily. Um, but it, it had such a sort of a st strong kind of, I guess, m movement or current um, that it, it was quite difficult to, um, I suppose, find my own, I guess, find my own feet, find my own ground. Um, so I just, bide, I guess I just bided my time for, for a while, you know. Um, 
and and so yeah I just I yeah I left it for a bit because I wasn't really sure you know I didn't think I had necessarily a message or you know and as it turned out anyway I think a lot of um my grievance was, I mean, there, were, there was a sense of grievance and there was kind of an anger in the book, right, in Checkout 19. But actually, um, I, I realised that that was more to do with, say, class. I think it was much more to do with class than it was to do with, um, with, being, a fem with being a female. Or it was meant to do with being specifically a working class female, which had then another set of complexities and inflections and, and things to kind of think about, too. So, um, yeah, yeah, and then, you know, and there was that period where I didn't really kind of sort of like being identified as a writer, I felt a bit weird about it, but see, in the time since, I, um, I do quite a lot of, uh, like, commission stuff, I write some articles and um, essays and stuff, some of it's on art and just various different bits and pieces, I've written some introductions to some books that have been uh, published. So in a way, I feel like, oh yeah, that's it's my job, right? It's how I'm earning my living. So I don't have, it's my vocation. So I don't have a problem now with saying I'm a writer because, you know, I'm sending the invoices. I'm kind of, it's that working class spirit still maybe. But, you know, I'm doing the invoices. I'm like, oh, they haven't paid me. Like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like a plumber or something, you know? <laughs> I like, and I moan, you know, I moan to my, my friends. Oh, I'm sending these invoices and this person hasn't paid me. And, just driving me nuts. So there is that very um, practical, just day-to-day -day earning a living kind of aspect to it that um, has has completely yeah enabled me to say yeah I'm absolutely a writer now now pay up. <laughs> <laughs>